Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our weekly Thursday evening uh, Apostolic School and Dialogue. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're still busy with the Spirit of Christ, and tonight I want to speak to you on part nine. And uh, the title for tonight is The Expediency of the Coming of the Holy Spirit. Uh, our scripture is in John 16, verse 7. It says, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come. But if I go, I will send him unto you. We see this is a place where Jesus was preparing to leave this world. He then promises the disciples in this specific scripture that his departure will be to their benefit and for their gain. And that the comfortable whom he will send will take his place and be to them far better than ever he had been or could be, could be in his bodily presence. There are basically two important reasons for this statement that we need to understand as we study the Spirit of Christ. First of all, that his interaction with the disciples had never been unbroken, but it was still liable for interruption. And now, at this time in the season, it would be broken off by his death, and then they would see him no more. Secondly, what we need to understand is that the Spirit would then abide with them forever. His own interaction had very much been external and the effect of this had not been resulted in what might have been expected. But now, when he leaves them and the Spirit is being poured out, the Spirit would then be in them. And his coming then would be as an indwelling presence on the inside of them. In the power of that indwelling, they would have Jesus too in them as their life and as their strength. During the life of Jesus on the earth, each of his disciples was dealt with by him in accordance with his peculiar character or the special circumstances in which he might be placed. And we see that his interaction with his disciples was an intensely personal one. In everything he proved that he knew his sheep by name. For each one of his disciples, there was a thoughtfulness and a wisdom that met them with just what was required. Now the question arises whether the Spirit would supply this need to and give back to them that tenderness of personal interest and that special individual dealings which had made the guidance of Jesus to them so precious. I want to say to you there can be no doubt about it. Because all that Christ had been to them, the Spirit was to restore in an even greater measure power and in a purity that now should no rope, no no break or separation. They would be far happier and safer and stronger with Jesus being seated with the Father than they ever could have been with him on the earth. I believe this is one of the very foremost beauties and purities of their discipleship with the Lord Jesus as their Lord and as their Master. He was so wise and patient to give to each one just what they needed and to make each one feel that he had in him his best friend and that he could never be left out. You see, this indwelling of the Spirit was intended to restore Christ's most, post, most pop, excuse me, Christ's most personal interaction in guidance. His very direct and personal friendship in the life of every, every believer. Sadly, we see that many believers find this very difficult. 
to conceive, or even to believe it. Much less do we see many believers actually experience this. But the thought of Christ walking with men on the earth, living and guiding them, is very clear. The thought of the Spirit hiding himself within us and speaking to us, not in distinct thoughts, but only in the secret depths of our inner life, makes the reality of his guidance so much more difficult for us as human beings to understand it and to grasp it. What constitutes the greater difficulty of the new and the spiritual interaction and guidance is actually what gives it its greater worth and also its greater purity. It is the same principle that we see in our daily lives. Difficulty, difficulty, difficulties calls out the powers. It strengthens the will. It develops our character. It forms us as human beings. In a child, first lessons he has to be helped and encouraged. But as he goes on to what is more difficult, we see that as a teacher, you will leave him to his own resources. We see that a youth will leave his parents' roof to have the principles that have been installed in his life being tested, but also strengthened. In each of these situations, it is expedient that the outward presence and help be withdrawn and that the soul now must rely upon itself to apply and assimilate the lessons that it had been taught. You see, God wants to educate us. He indeed wants to bring us to a perfect manhood, not ruled by an outward law, but by that inner life through the spirit within us. You see, as long as Jesus was with the disciples on the earth, he had to work from without, inward, yet could never effectually reach and master the innermost parts of his disciples. When he went away, he sent his spirit to be in them, so that now their growth might be from within outwards. And taking possession first by his spirit of the inmost recesses of their beings, he would have them then in the voluntary consent and surrender to his inspiration and to his guidance. They then could personally become what he himself is through his spirit in them. As a result, they would have the framing of their life, the forming of their character in their own hands, in the power of the divine spirit, who really now had become their spirit, the spirit within. They would grow up to that true inner autonomy, in the true independence of the outward demands and influences in which they could become like Christ himself. A true separate person having the life in himself, yet only the only living life in the Father. You see, as long as we as believers only ask that what is easy and pleasant, we will never understand that it is practically really better for us that Christ should not be in the earth. As soon as the thoughts of difficulty and sacrifice are set aside, we see that in the honest desire to become a truly God-like man, who are bearing the full image of the firstborn son and in all things living well-pleasing to the Father, the thought of Jesus' departure that his spirit may now become our very own and that we be exercised and disciplined in the life of faith, we will welcome that with gladness and with gratitude. You see, if we want to follow the leading of the spirit, and experience that dimension of the personal friendship and guidance of Jesus in that process, we must accept that it will be much more a much more difficult and even dangerous path than it would have been to follow him in his physical presence here on earth. We must remember the privilege we enjoy the nobility we received and the intimacy of fellowship with God that we enter now into. All of these are infinitely greater than having Jesus walking in the earth.
You see, to have the Holy Spirit of God coming through the human nature of our Lord, entering into our spirit, identifying himself with us, and then becoming our very own, just as he was, the Spirit of Christ Jesus on earth. Surely, guys, this is a purity and a sanctification that is worth any sacrifice, for it is the very beginning of the indwelling of God himself. I pray that you will see this indwelling and that you will realize that this is such a privilege and needs to be such a desire that we so earnestly desire this that it, however, does not remove the difficulty of the challenges that we face in this process. So the question then again arises, how can the interaction of Jesus with his disciples on the earth, with so much tenderness, so particular and so minute in its interest, yet so consciously personal in its love, be ours to the same agree, degree now that he is absent and that the Spirit is now to be our guide? The first answer, and I th I'm sure you all know this, is just the same answers through our whole Christian life and walk. It is by faith. With Jesus on the earth, the disciples, once they have believed, they walk by sight. But you see, from the very beginning, we have to walk by faith. In faith, we must accept and we must rejoice in these words of Jesus in John 16, 7, when he says, I will tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. I want to say to you, I think we are so contaminated with everything that we've been taught in the charismatic season and the Pentecostal season, and all the stuff that we've received. And I want to encourage you that you need to take a specific time to take a step back in order to process what I'm sharing here with you. Take us time to believe it. Take time to agree with it. Take time to approve it. And take time to rejoice that he's returned to be with the Father. You see, we must learn to thank and praise Jesus that he has called us to this life in the Spirit. We must believe that in this gift of the Spirit, we experience the presence and the interaction of Jesus he is so fully secured for us, most certainly and efficiently. It may be indeed be in a way that we sometimes fully do, still do not understand, but because we have believed and rejoiced so little in the gift of the Holy Spirit, but by faith we must believe and praise him for what it does, and not even yet if we don't understand it. Let us then believe and confidently and joyfully that the Holy Spirit and Jesus himself through him will teach us how this interaction and guidance are to be enjoyed here and now. In John 14, 26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. I want to highlight the words will teach you, will teach us. We must be careful not to misunderstand these words. Because as human beings, we always have this tendency to connect teachings with thoughts. We want the Holy Spirit to suggest to us certain conceptions of how Jesus will be with us and in us. Guys, this is not what he does. The Spirit does not dwell in our mind, but in the life in us. The Spirit begins his work, not in what we know, Listen yet, but in what we are. So 
Do not let us seek or expect a clear apprehension or a new insight at once into this dimension or any other divine truth. Knowledge, thoughts, feelings, actions is all part of that external religion which the external presence of Jesus had also manifested itself in the disciples. We see that the Spirit was now to come, and deeper down than all these, the Spirit was to be the hidden presence of Jesus within the depths of their personality. The divine life was in a newness of power to become their life, and the teaching of the Spirit would begin not in word or thought, but in power. In the power of life that is working in them secretly, but with divine energy. In the power of a faith that rejoiced that Jesus was really near, was really taking charge of the whole life and every circumstance of it. We see that the Spirit would then inspire them with the faith of the indwelling Jesus. This would be the beginning and the purity of this teaching of Jesus. They would have the life of Jesus within them, and they would by faith know that it was Jesus. And their faith would be at once both the cause and the effect of the presence of the Lord in the Spirit. It is by such a faith, a faith which the Spirit breathes, which come from his being and living in us, that the presence of Jesus is to be as real and all sufficient to us as when he was on the earth. Let me ask you this question. But why then is it that believers who have the, have the Spirit of God do not experience it more consciously and more fully? Guys, the answer to this is very simple. They know the Spirit. They honor the Spirit who is in them so little. They have a lot of faith in Jesus who died, or even who reigns in heaven, but they have little faith in Jesus who dwells in them by his Spirit. And I want to challenge you and say to you that you need to shift to that place where you have much faith in Jesus who dwells in you by his spirit and we need the faith for faith in jesus in order to be the fulfiller of that promise remember what the scripture tells us in john 7 verse 38 he who believes in me as the scriptures has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water you see, we must believe that the Holy Spirit is within us as the presence of our Lord Jesus. We must not only believe this with the faith of our understanding as it seeks to persuade, persuade itself of the truth of what Christ says. We must believe it with our heart, with the heart in which the Holy Spirit dwells. The whole gift of the Spirit, the whole teaching of Jesus concerning the Spirit, is to enforce the word that the declaration that the kingdom of God is within you. If we would only grasp the reality and the truth of this, because this is almost an explosion that needs to take place on the inside of you when you realize that the kingdom of God is within you because of the spirit of Christ that is in you. If we would really have the true faith of heart, let us then turn inwards and very gently and very humbly yield to the Holy Spirit to do this work on the inside of us. To receive this teaching and this faith, which stands in the life and power of the Spirit, let us above all fear that what would hinder this working of the Spirit of God in us the most, which is the will of man 
and the wisdom of man. We are still so surrounded by a life of self, by a life of the flesh, even in the service of God, and even in our efforts to exercise faith, because it is forever putting itself forward in its own strength. Every thought, and not only every evil thought, but every thought, however, it might be good, in which our mind runs before the spirit, must be captured and brought into activity and surrendered to the Holy Spirit. Let us today make this conscious decision to take charge of our own will and wisdom, hold it captive, and then once we've grabbed it and we've held it captive, let us lay it down at the feet of Jesus. And then once we have done that, wait in faith, and in the holy quietness of soul at the feet of the cross, so that the Spirit will reveal himself to us, in us. I want to say to you that the deep consciousness within us will grow strong that the Spirit is within us, and that his divine life is living and growing within us. And as we in this manner honor him and surrender ourselves to him, and as we bring our fleshly activities into subjection and wait on him, he will not put us to shame, but he will do this work on the inside of us. He will strengthen our inner life. He will quicken our faith. And above all, he will reveal Jesus. And we then shall step by step, moment by moment, learn that the presence and that personal intercourse and intimacy that guidance of Jesus are ours and it will be to us be so clear and so sweet yes even more truly and mightily than even if he was walking with us here on the earth I want today to encourage you to embrace this truth in faith to surrender yourself in all that you are at the feet of Jesus in order to experience this awesome and gracious presence of the Spirit of Christ on the inside of you. Again, I want to emphasize to you, you cannot just listen to this message once and then think you've got it. You've got to meditate on it. Stop the video. Listen to what I'm saying. Listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Because there needs to be that dropping into your spirit, that explosion of the spirit on the inside of you, where a heart revelation bursts forth from your innermost being. And that you begin to realize that Christ is living on the inside of you by his spirit that the spirit of christ is alive and well on the inside of you jesus dwells in you by his spirit and therefore we can walk in this earth as sons of the most high god because we know where we are we 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 have received our adoption as sons into his kingdom god bless you as you meditate upon this and great grace to you during this time. Until we meet again, God bless.